There's not enough resources to go around in today's environment to match sustainment and modernization requirements. So a sustainment strategy provides the means by which to balance and project capability for customers and provide readiness, protect sovereign interests, promote peace and security, and be able to respond to contingency on a moment's notice. So we really, really want our customers to look into that, see how it benefits them, and use what we have as columns to make their airplanes last, fly longer, and be mission capable all the time. Militaries rely on a vast range of systems and equipment, some of which has been in service for decades. Because the future is difficult to predict, sustainment strategies must be adaptable and mobile. To deliver on these goals, militaries must build strong relationships with industry. Such collaboration provides access to the intellectual property and technical data that is vital for effective sustainment, particularly for countries lacking abundant resources. Welcome to Shepherd Studios Critical Care Podcast, the story of military aircraft sustainment and support in an unpredictable world. We're brought to you in partnership with our sponsor, Collins Aerospace. In this episode, we examine the importance of military industry collaboration and learn about the various ways companies are enhancing military aircraft sustainment. We also hear about the advantages and the challenges of the relationship with a focus on the particular issues faced by nations in Asia-Pacific. But why should nations develop a sustainment strategy in the first place? This is Chris Hill, Director of Programme Strategy for the Global Sustainment Modernisation Division at the Defence Division of Northrop Grumman. Well, I think aging aircraft dynamics, you know, including obsolescence, uh, diminishing sources of manufacturing, diminishing sources of supply, and plain old airplanes breaking in new ways and new airplanes breaking in old ways, uh, each of these challenges really present a threat to readiness. And my belief is that, you know, the reason why a strategy is important is because we need to balance readiness, reliability, and cost-effectiveness for our customers. According to Rick Ching, Business Development Manager for Collins Aerospace Services and Support across the Asia-Pacific, there are two key priorities for operators when it comes to military sustainment. The first is really the ability to turn the asset around. In the shortest possible time, they want to have that um, aircraft in the air. They want to have the uh, repaired equipment back so that they can have it back into service. For the case of this, you know, repaired equipment, avionics equipment, the timeliness of getting this item repaired and certified and then back to service would be the greatest concern to the operator because that would affect their mission success rate. The the other area that they will probably look into is uh, managing the uh, fleet equipment obsolescence, which is usually a result of uh, technological advancement or flight-related regulation requirements. And um, one of these challenges is kind of like how to get that asset, you know, to be repaired timely, how to keep the uh, aircraft to be ready to respond to an external threat. So one way to achieve this is um, by mitigating the uh, potential risks or the threat, like turnaround time, as we mentioned earlier. And here in Collins, we design sustainment strategy to improve the asset accountability uh, by reducing turnaround times on parts by isolating no fault file on site. So if the item has got no fault file, it can always be returned back to the uh, aircraft for service. Government and industry have a shared interest in collaboration with the aim of making the sustainment process as effective as possible. My sense is that our military customer really wants more flexibility and to be able to make uh, investments in an age of persistent modernization where Essentially, uh, technology is growing faster and more rapidly than the services can adjust their, what I'll call target or aim point. And I think industry is looking for a strong and consistent signal across the planning and programming time horizons in order to 
really get that return on their investment on the advancements that they're making, um, not only in sustainment, but across over an array of capabilities. So going forward, you know, the, the U.S. Department of Defense just commissioned a team of really senior people who have a, a tremendous amount of experience in acquisition and sustainment. And they're going to be looking at, you know, the planning, programming, budget execution system uh, from tip to tail. And, you know, you think about that system, it, it's over 60 years old now, and it's cumbersome. Uh, it's very bureaucratic. Uh, and I think the the services complain about it as much as industry does. So uh, it, that is a shared interest, and I, I look forward to to seeing the results of their effort. For Collins Aerospace, the critical goal is to support its customers so that they're thoroughly prepared and able to take immediate actions in response to an external threat. Performance based logistics can support this ambition. What happens is that as and when and equipment becomes non-serviceable. Um, the customer have that equipment returned back to a call-in facilities, our service center, have that um, tear apart, evaluate, and then to uh, fault find as to what failed in that box. At the end of the day, you know, we will then disclose to the customer, this is what we have found out. And this is gonna take so much man hour, so much material cost to get that repair done. Then this information feeds back to the customer who then decide, okay, yes, I, I would want to go with the repair or no, I think this is already, um, some of the terms you hear is like beyond economic repair. So burr, if an item becomes a burr, then they think that, okay, I better off buy a new one than to spend that same amount of money to fix the old one. So in that case, we have return the equipment as it is. Well, aircraft are generally in service for more than 30 years. So you really need a well-planned out support arrangement that will endure well into the future. The future is pretty difficult to predict 30 years out. This is Deanne Barnett, Northrop Grumman's Director of Sustainment and Modernisation Services. So they need to be adaptable and they need to be designed in a way that delivers something that's reliable and enduring uh, and ideally, or almost essentially, aligned with uh, the particular operational deployment and readiness requirements for that specific platform. It really needs to be aligned with the concept of ops and the weapon system plan. Otherwise, you just can't get you know, the right people with the right equipment, technical information, the right parts, right location, all collected together in a responsive and effective way. You know, so sustainment resources are not limitless. So you really need to strike a balance between what everyone would love and what's really affordable. So compromises have to be made. The strategy just needs to be able to adapt um, over the life. And, you know, there's technology changes that will occur inevitably. So we really need to set up a sustainment system that can deal with that. So it must be able to deal with upgrades and capabilities so that it continues to have an operational edge. and there will be obsolescence. So you must have a system that can proactively manage that. Um, and particularly in today's world where the technology is very digital, it has a much shorter refresh life. So it's almost from the very beginning of a platform that you need to plan that into your sustainment strategy. Of course, sustainment needs differ depending on the country or region in question. Asia Pacific, for instance, presents a massive range of challenges and opportunities. There's 36 nations, 50% of the world's populations, more than 3,000 languages. Asia Pacific contains two of the three largest economies in the world and 10 of the 14 smallest economies. There are several of the world's largest militaries and also five U.S. national mutual defense treaty allies in the region. So when I think about the size and the scale and the scope of Asia Pacific, I, I think about the attributes of air power. I, I think about speed, range, tempo, adaptability and precision, and what the impacts are of those for military readiness. And, and quite frankly, if you, you can move to a, a different line of thinking and just think about a broader maritime saltwater environment, with a vast range of climates from Arctic to the equator, 
onto the Antarctic. Those also prevent challenges for sustainment, and they also present challenges for planning and operations and military execution through the theater. There is, of course, significant economic variation across nations in this region. Some lack the resources to build economies of scale or cannot secure direct access to American and European capabilities. Such countries must be selective, prioritizing certain aspects of their sustainment strategy. There's a number of uh, older legacy platforms that are still in services in the Asia Pac today. Most of this aircraft has been uh, flying for the last couple of decades. And generally, the options that are faced by them would be either the retirement of this aircraft or the upgrade uh, to be able to cope up with um, air traffic compliances or technological advances, enhancement, as well as addressing obsolescence, um, like um, the uh, round gauges that we used to fly with. I mean, those are now um, not as popular and we move on to others like um, this place. So, so there's obsolescence there. There's also technological enhancement right there. So we have you know, overlapping of an aircraft going out of service later than planned. So it's aged and it's got additional support problems as it's going up the bathtub curve. And you're introducing a new platform to replace it that's just starting at the top of the bathtub curve. So you've got two platforms in operation at the same time at the wrong ends of their bathtub curves. Um, And when you're doing that across 10 different platforms at the same time, you really need a lot of capacity. And that's quite exacerbated in Australia at the moment. And we're all working on how to um, address that situation. So a long way of saying it's really important that we manage the final years of a platform in the most efficient and cost-effective way so that we're not wasting resources for the aircraft leaving service so we can concentrate our efforts on the aircraft that are coming into service and that those people and the capacity we can get there is on developing those new skills, accessing that new data and learning best how to maintain and operate those new technologies um, rather than you know running around the globe trying to find old parts um, so that we can fly for another six months on the, the, an old capability. Countries can turn to various teaming arrangements with industry to secure the technical data and intellectual property that empower effective sustainment. Deanne Barnett outlines the approach taken in Australia. Generally, they use performance-based contracts in almost all cases. And these are long-term arrangements, generally with one or two prime contractors. And those contractors are supported by a really complex global network of OEMs and tiered technology suppliers. You know, also within that enterprise, the defence itself has many organisations involved in the sustainment of the capability, each with different roles, you know, operations, regulations, providing infrastructure training. So there's lots and lots of players in in the support of a single platform and ensuring sustainment. So in the last decade in defence, they've really been progressing towards a whole of enterprise approach that encourages and ensures all those stakeholders are engaged and aligned in the strategy requirements of the platform and the risk and issues that uh, need to be managed to make sure it's successful. One mechanism the Australian Department of Defence now uses for its asset management is what's known as the Capability Acquisition and Sustainment Enterprise, or CASE, framework. The CASE model was developed to address the increased technological complexity of modern aircraft, enabling a more holistic asset management approach. CASE allows the DoD to be more inclusive across a broader range of stakeholders, share more information with industry, and enable a more collaborative decision-making process. So they call this thing um, Capability Acquisition and Sustainment Enterprise, or the CASE model, and it recognises that there are different people with different roles to play in the success of the sustainment. So you have the capability owners, 
you're operating and managing the aircraft, you've got industry, you're providing, you know, majority of the support services, and you've got the CASG, the procurement agency, which is managing that whole environment. So it gives them a structured approach to be a smart buyer, to facilitate, to advise, and giving them the ability to really manage what industry is delivering to the capability. This approach has been applied to a wide range of Australian platforms, bringing benefits in collective outcomes, better decisions, containing costs and being more responsive in delivery. It really encourages the parties to participate, to uh, set clear requirements and performance expectations, to be collaborative and also just creates a general environment of being aligned and harmonious as an enterprise. I mean, one example of it is the KC30 multi-role tanker transport enterprise, which has been a very well established in Australia for some time now. Um, this is where the Air Force's Air Mobility Group, GASG, Northrop Grumman as the through life support provider, Airbus as the OEM of the platform, and CAE as the training system contractor, have a collective enterprise strategy, we've got common goals and a governance structure that supports collective decision-making and responsive action. And it's really paid off. You know, the sustainment's improved a lot for the platform and really the tanker capability in Australia is world-class. You know, on a more tactical level, the way in which the two workforces can act together can be really beneficial. So it breaks down the barriers between industry and military and you get the best of the both um, and and what they have to offer. So, for example, in a maintenance context, you put industry people in an operational maintenance environment, you get additional capacity, uh, the unit can continue to operate when the majority of its uniform people may be on a deployment or undertaking uh, heavy training duties, the unit can still function. Formal partnerships are key to enabling industry and militaries to work together in delivering sustainment. While PBL is one such structure, another is public-private partnerships, which allow industry to partner with services to invest in readiness. Let's hear from Chris Hill again. I think uh, partnerships are a key to industry and the militaries working together in order to provide sustainment to uh, fleets of all kind. Uh, I think if you look for examples of uh, partnerships, there's uh, two different types of structures that I would highlight. Uh, One is uh, the performance-based logistics. uh, And the other that I'd like to highlight specifically is uh, public-private partnerships uh, that are an important part of the way that here in the US, industry partners Uh, with the services in order to execute the restoration and really the investment in readiness for the services. Those public partner private ships really are uh, a backbone that supports not only government interests, but in many cases, industry provides the engineering, uh, the mission assurance, uh, some semblance of furnished equipment, a supply chain, support, vendor management support, and the customer provides touch labor, uh, management supervision, quality assurance, or some combination thereof. The end results really sort of vary by partner. And I would say that there's really two ranges of performance and and the poorest performers or the poorest performing partnerships are merely transactional. Uh, For instance, where one partner thinks that you know, there's a hierarchy, if you will, and maybe the partner says uh, that word partner and the other partner feels like maybe they're more of a subcontractor um, on the best end. And this is really what I want to emphasize is the partnership experience should feel uh, I would describe it as transformational. And a critical factor across you know, my experience of having more than 20 partnerships it's commitment. And uh, that, that's a commitment to a common goal. Uh, that's a commitment to collaboration and problem solving. 
Uh, and really it's leadership's acceptance of accountability and delivering results on behalf of the partnership. And that's on both sides. That's on government and the industry side. And I think that's really important. For every program, we're always looking for a way to include the sustainment in the final answer. This is Dylan Monaghan, Collins Aerospace's Chief of Strategic Programs in the Asia-Pacific region. Customers often don't want to pay for sustainment on day one. They just want the lowest price because that's the way governments choose them, by the lowest price. What we want to offer is the best value and the best lifetime commitment to that airplane, to that park. And often it's a better deal to join one of our PBL programs, one of our programs that kind of looks at the life cycle of the whole airplane and take a small fee up front and gives them a guaranteed uh, up status. So the airplane's always ready. It's a hard concept to convince the finance people. The operators love it because their airplane is there all the time. They have a fixed cost. They don't have to worry about the up and down of maintenance. And in the end, it works out for everyone. We know what the customer is going to need in advance and we can plan better. But the current model is still based on something from the old 1900s. It breaks, then send someone out to fix it. We can do better. We can theoretically plan ahead when something's going to break and we can have the part ready and replace it before it actually causes an airplane to be down. So we really, really want our customers to look into that, see how it benefits them, and use what we have as columns to make their airplanes last, fly longer, and be mission ready more times than often or be mission ready, be mission capable all the time. For many companies in the sector, the collaboration with the military customer occurs at various different levels. One, there's inside our company, as we have engineers, program managers, folks like me, sales, we have the leadership, we have the folks who get the work done, make things and make the plans for the company. So that's one set of collaboration. Then we have our sales partners, our non-company sales reps, as we like to call them, the folks who may be going out and finding new business and coming back to us and telling us their needs. And then finally, we have the actual end user, the customer. Since I'm in the military side of this Collins Aerospace, our customer tends to be the military user. And so each of those collaborations is different. And getting the right feel for each team is different. How then does Collins Aerospace work to build relationships with customers in the Asia-Pacific region? How does a longer-term contract operate in terms of the relationship with the client? So uh, at the personal level, we talk about that collaboration where we're, we know the people we have a trust. And then when you get into the contracting portion, we have a number of ways of working with our clients. We have direct sales where we'll take a product. I will pass it through either a sales rep or direct to the customer and they pay a price and they buy it. And then they'll probably come back year after year for the same product, spares it, so forth. We have our foreign military sales, which is actually going through the U.S. government. We sell to the U.S. government. The U.S. government then takes on all of the overhead to get it to the customer. And then we also have our manufacturing license agreements, where a manufacturer in country will make the product either under license, or perhaps even if they uh, take on the, the full responsibility of developing the product, you can have a collaboration where that part is now developed in our target country and we're working with the developer uh, to make it even better for them and fit exactly their needs. There's a strong trend towards in-country testing and repair capabilities. Let's turn to Rick Ching for more details. Most operators um, actually see this as a benefit, um, especially for uh, equipments that are critical to their mission. So they would like to have the ability to have this repaired locally and then turn that um, equipment around very quickly. So as you know, not to incur additional expense of uh, getting space. Since it takes time to develop and um, to acquire, to deliver this capability to the customers, um, it is always good to consider this early on, um, especially during the uh, life cycle analysis and uh, planning phase. So you know, they, they need to kind of put this into plan and then how they want to go about doing this. Companies such as Collins Aerospace pursue such arrangements through various options. These include its depot arrangements, where it builds collaborative relationships with military service depots to enhance avionics service support. We do this in three different phases. 
So uh, phase one is the assessment, then the activation, and final phase is sustainment. I'll just kind of give a little bit of a point on each. So under assessment phase, um, the engineers, our engineers will perform assessment to determine the effort required to establish an intermediate or eye level or depot, D level repair capability at the operator's facility. So the, um, the point here is to really be able to assure the operators that the depot activation requirements, the schedule, the budgets are all provided to the operator for their consideration. Then once that is accepted by the operator, the uh, activation phase at the, uh, at the end of that would then really be basically about depot assessing planning activity to transition from the OEM managed repair to an overall sustainment partnership together with the operators. So this would then involve the development of the test bench, the test equipment, as well as the necessary training, uh, technical publications, and the attack data that are required. So, so this will need some time for us to apply for the um, appropriate export requirements in order to have this data being transferred to a, uh, outside of the US. And finally, um, we will talk about sustainment. So this is about the uh, ability to ensure the uh, longer term product sustainment uh, that could be done through you know, joint obsolescence uh, management studies. Uh, that could be done through uh, planning ahead and uh, being able to uh, have critical piece part available, um, especially for equipment that are towards the uh, tail end of their life cycle. So um, this is uh, something that we are seeing today in terms of the customer's desire to move towards um, having this uh, indigenous capability, the ability to do this in their own country. And, and again, that is because uh, it helps save time which means that they can uh, turn around the uh, equipment, turn around their asset much faster. Relationships between industry and the military are vital in Asia Pacific. Many of the unique challenges facing countries in the vast area can only be solved through collaboration. However, these nations are also keen to foster indigenous capability in sustainment, an area where industry support is also essential. One, one aspect of being prepared is to uh, turn the asset around in the shortest possible amount of time. And we are also seeing stronger desire from these operators to build in-country capabilities as uh, it not only helps to improve the uh, repair turnaround time, it also strengthens their local defense uh, capability. And as a result of all that, it gains higher degree of uh, self-reliance at the end. So... I, I say that, you know, Collins, we, we kind of, um, we are the OEM. So we will be able to support such a desire for them to have this uh, in-country capability, especially, you know, like a depot stand up. So uh, being able to repair this on their own. Um, and such kind of arrangement typically looks into the uh, supply of uh, test equipment, um, transfer of uh, know-hows, um, training, publications, and uh, other support elements like um, Calibration, annual calibration of equipment, um, engineering support, uh, technical support, and technical reach back. There was a time when countries just wanted to buy the best, come to America, buy the best, and uh, take it home, and then we'd support from a, a long distance. Uh, but countries want to protect their industries. They also want to make sure they're continuing to make things, which keeps their economy going. Every dollar spent in country stays in country. Every dollar you send out of the country never comes back or at least comes back in a long path. So keeping those industries running is one of the paramount desires for countries. Another focus is to make sure that the repair timeline is much shorter. Sending a part, getting the export license, sending it back to the US, getting the repair acknowledged, awarded, and then put into our chain and repaired and sent back. If you have lots of spares on the shelf and you can wait for that loop, you're fine. But if you want to have a quick turnaround, you don't want to have a lot of spares, you want to have a one or two day turnaround, having that repairability in country is great. And so our services team is always seeking to find ways to include 
the repair in the initial contract. When you buy a product, how are you going to support it? It may be that we have a supply depot that's ready to support you right away, or it may be that you're going to take the parts and repair them yourself, and we'll show you how to do that. But yes, there is a big push to have indigenous manufacturing, indigenous repair to shorten that loop. There are clear logistical drivers for this move to indigenous capabilities in Asia Pacific. So when you're here in Asia Pac, what's fascinating is how far everything is from each other. You know, the distance, the tyranny of distance just means that if you want to get one part repaired and you're looking at your fleet of 100 airplanes, maybe you only have two or three spares and you have two or three failures. You don't have a week, a month, 90 days to wait for the part. You need the part now. If you can walk across the street to your manufacturing plant and say, give me this part now, and at 24 hours later, they put it on a bus and it's there at your plant. Another 24 hours later, it's on the airplane, airplanes fly again. That's what countries want. They want that access that shortens their time that an airplane is not flying. And who doesn't? And if you can do that in country, you keep that money in country. You keep your costs at where you can expect them to be, and your airplanes are happy. What can industry do to support this demand? From a Collins perspective, one of the things we provide is the ability for the customer to choose the system that works best for them. They can either go on a per parts basis, where they'll just buy a part from us and we'll ship it to them. They can go on a PBL, where we'll just hit a fixed price. What's the up rate you're looking for? What's the turn time you want? Do you want parts in an hour? Do you want parts in 24 hours? Do you want parts in a week? And we'll set up a facility to get you the spare parts when you need them and you pay us a fixed price. Or you can go to the extreme of building all the parts yourself. Parts can be released and you can then in our own country uh, go ahead and maintain those parts. And we have a variety of plans for all of our customers. And I think all of them are in effect somewhere in Asia Pac at one form or another. The operational requirement will naturally differ by customer. This will impact a range of factors, including cost. Hence, also the uh, sustainment goal will be uh, slightly differing. And this will likely result in a different cost saving over time for, say, customer A. Um, in some cases, they may find that this may not be fees- um, financially feasible um, right now. And, and then maybe postponing this decision to a later time. Um, another way of looking at it, it's also dependent on the uh, size of the, uh, the fleet and um, the number of quantities of equipment that they are looking at repairing. But I do see the uh, one common theme across all this is really about the operator's desire to be uh, more self-reliant and having this necessary test equipment, test capabilities, resource, the repairs and the skills to get this item, this equipment repair in country. And that um, sometimes outweighs the cost of um, you know, owning or acquiring that equipment. So from that perspective, I'll see that uh, these customers will value self-reliance. Uh, it's a very huge component in their decision-making process um, over just um, simply cost. Our customers and potential customers are more and more interested in the entire life cycle cost of anything coming down down the pike and its ability to operate remotely, its ability to operate in a disconnected environment, um, ability to you know reduce a logistics footprint and uh, ease the of the burden on the maintainer. This is Mike Moody, Bell's manager for integrated product support for the future vertical lift program. He explains that there's been a vast range of changes in sustainment over the years from the processes involved to the workforce itself, as well as the technologies deployed. The military workforce is different. Great aptitude, high aptitude. Uh, and my experience was, you know, fewer shade tree mechanics out there coming to you and they learn differently. So the workforce is simply different. Cost is higher. The cost of making a bad call when you replace a component is higher. So uh, it, everything is everything is different. You know, we went through this time in the in the late 1990s, when we relied on just-in-time logistics, where we we drew down uh, inventories and a lot of our parts, and, and we were going to rely on the speed of the logistics system. Then 9/11 happened, and we 
new, not only do you have to have sophisticated distribution systems, you, you really do need a lot of stockpiles of parts. And, and for the last 20 years or so, we've worked in very sophisticated forward operating bases uh, with what I call mountains of iron and, and, and in some cases, rather static. That, that's all changing in, in the new environment that the Department of Defense describes. It's, it's, a, it's a more lethal, it's a more mobile, it's a less static. It's a, the uh, need to operate in a disconnected environment, a need to operate with less maintenance, longer times between maintenance activities uh, that aircraft are more resilient and more maintainable at, at the lowest level. So all of that speaks to how do you enable those attributes with the tools that you have. Those tools are and those approaches are certainly enhanced by leveraging uh, what Bell calls digital thread. And that is being able to connect and, and to use uh, original source data by all the downstream consumers of that data. So you don't have to repackage data uh, that originated in a design environment and then repackage it for maintenance manuals, repackage it for you know instructions to the fleet, repackage it for uh, technical manuals. It, it's all the same data. So that accuracy is improved, speed of distribution is improved. And, and that, that tie and, and the ability to update that data, that, that speed is, is increased and the lag time is decreased. In episode four, we'll take a deeper look at the digital technologies and open architectures, examining how such advances are impacting military sustainment. For now, let's turn to Rick Ching for some final thoughts on just how the sustainment model is evolving and the directions it could take in the years ahead. If we look at the last decade or so, um, I think we can see that in the Asia Pacific region, there has been um, quite a substantial fair bit of um, fleet modernization and fleet upgrades um, happening. And the upgrades are mostly to the uh, legacy platform that we mentioned, like the uh, C-130, uh, the Chinook, uh, the UH-60s. So um, along with that, we also see this growing um, interest and the uh, willingness to adopt um, PBL as a sustainment model. Um, and, and the reason could be, you know, and the reason is most likely because this brings, you know, um, a better management of their life cycle process uh, as compared to the other form of, say, time and material. So we see this movement towards PBL uh, more willingly accepted across Asia Pacific. And again, I, I just want to touch that we being the OEM, um, we can ensure, we can help ensure that, you know, you have the right solution uh, for your mission set. And then um, we can be able to tailor the solution, the sustainment solution, according to your operational objective to provide you with increased availability, reliability, and affordability. So I think all this would help when we work jointly with the operators to help them move forward and uh, to meet their fleet readiness goal. Next time on the Critical Care Podcast, we look more closely at the advantages new digital technologies are bringing to the world of military aircraft sustainment. There's no doubt that uh, digital technology provides powerful tools and exciting opportunities for the industry. It tracks everything. Every piece of data that is going through our system is tracked. The maintenance guys can download it, stick it into a machine and say, here's what we see coming. I do believe that digital engineering will accelerate the pace of sustainment and modernization. Uh, I, I think that will be the way of the future. That's next time on the Critical Care Podcast. The Critical Care Podcast was produced by Shepherd Studio in partnership with Collins Aerospace. A huge thanks for their support. Thanks also to everyone who provided their time to support the project. The Critical Care Podcast was produced by Tony Skinner and Jack Austin, with research and interviews by Damien Kemp, script writing by Jared Cowan, and audio edits by Noemi DiStefano. Until next time.